Hey everyone, welcome back to 30 Days of Data. This is our second day. Today, we're gonna go through the entire forecasting pipeline. This is the second part of three for our forecasting series. Our first forecasting video, we went through a bunch of things. We went through what the data structures are for the data we're gonna be using for forecasting, all of that sales data. We also went through generally what a time series model slash forecasting model even is. We talked a bit about data cleaning, the actual model itself, the seasonality and trends that go into the model, as well as cross-validation and the general pipeline for machine learning models. Today, we're gonna be putting everything we learned together. So if you haven't seen that video, I'd strongly recommend, like my goal with this series is to get you to really think like a data scientist. And that video is like my first 30 minutes of what I would do when I had new data and had to build a new model. This video is gonna show you how to put everything together in the forecasting pipeline and going through our entire order of processes for machine learning. We're gonna automate every single part of this process. Cleaning and processing data in the right format for the model and determining if we have enough data for the model itself. Cross-validation to get the best possible hyper-tuned parameters for our model without overfitting because usually a good machine learning model is a generalized model. And at the end, just putting together our entire pipeline. Honestly, at the end of this, you should be able to copy this Jupyter notebook and put in whatever time series data you want and just use this code as your first step to evaluation. So let's get straight into it. Hey guys. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Priya. I'm currently a senior data scientist at Uber. And my goal with this entire series is just to make data science more accessible. I really want you to understand how to think like a data scientist and get the resources to do so. So I am providing all of these Jupyter Notebooks link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Really gonna help out with the algorithm. I don't need to tell you that as a data scientist. Also look at this analytics. Like you guys are watching the videos, you're not even subscribed. Definitely subscribe. It means a lot to me and hopefully it'll mean a lot to other people when this video reaches them. Let's get into the pipeline code. Hey everyone. So this time I'm going to do Google Meet. Last time I just used my camera. So let me know if you like this more of the last one, but let's get straight into it. We're going to go through this demand forecasting pipeline. You've seen these before. We're importing functions and I read in two custom functions of my own. Over here, we're reading in the data. As we previously talked about in the first video, we're using a sales data set for from Kaggle of Favorita stores in Ecuador. And this is just generally like time series data. There's a lot of different columns. We end up pivoting and creating a total sales data frame over here. So you can see each column requires its own time series model because this is a time series like data set with like a variety of categories and all these need to be forecasted separately. So over here, I just plotted like raw data to show you what it looks like. And I know we previously chatted about how we have to fix data processing like over over here, like, you know, books doesn't really have enough sufficient data for a time series model. There's a bunch of drops to zero on the first of every year, which is obviously just like a general like store error and not an inherent seasonality of the model. Okay, so let's go straight into the data processing stuff. So we see that like generally there isn't any like missing or null data. So those must be zeros like the issues we have drops in. So I've created data cleaning requirements. I have four requirements here. And this is generally how I personally would go through a basic automation cleaning for time series data. The first is remove all low volume data that can't be predicted. In my experience, building a bunch of time series models, you generally want more than $1,000 or a thousand units or a thousand whatever a day just to forecast through the noise. You can't really forecast something like, and that's only like, you know, $20, $30 in sales because you can't really go through the noise. So the first thing we do is remove low volume data. The second is remove situations where there's not enough data in terms of the fact that there might be nulls or zeros or it just looks off. So that's the second. And then the third is remove outliers. The way we do this is calculate a z-score. And then we just remove all those values because profit imputes everything on the back end. So you're allowed to skip a couple days here and there. And that's okay with the way profit handles time series data. So it's going to impute those values. Generally, removing it by z-score is going to remove those outliers. So the situations where there's like a sudden drop to zero, that is going to be an outlier. So that's going to work really well for us in most cases. The fourth is we're going to filter it to the past two years worth of data because we're going to use the most recent amount of data. If you know that the trends stay the same for more than a couple of years, the more data, the better. I've just visually inspecting this and having tested everything out before making this video. I know the last two years is going to be good. 
this is a call you're going to have to make with your data. The first thing I do is apply a function over here. You can see it for the total sales data frame. I apply a function called NP mean across the column. So I get the average sales across all of the columns and all of it's on the daily level, right? So I get average daily sales. If I see a situation where average daily sales is less than $1,000, I remove that column over here. That means we dropped about 14 columns from our data frame. Now we're going to move on to outliers and Z score. These are all of the columns we're going to be forecasting for. Over here, I just want to let you know what a Z score is. It's the number of standard deviations you are away from the mean. So a Z score of three, anything outside of that is really only 0.28% of data. So like a quarter of 1% of data is going to have three plus standard deviations. Generally, if you're okay with cutting data out, like if you set your Z score as two, then you're going to preserve 95%, 95.44% of data. And the other like about four and a half percent is going to be removed as outliers. So you can generally people set their Z score as three because you're preserving 99.7% of the data. In my case, I set my Z score as a 2.7. That was uh, pretty good for me. And we're really not dropping that many days of data. So over here, I set my Z score. I create an outlier index using the NP dot where Z score is above 2.7. Now I drop on the index level. I set the index to outlier index and I just drop all of those rows that are our outliers. You see that really like the only situation where we're dropping more than like three weeks worth of data total is for frozen foods and for home and kitchen. Now that we've dropped all these outliers, if we plot the same final cleaned up categories, you can see that these look so much better than what we saw before. You see spikes on the regular, probably on weekends, because this is a sales data set. This is what everything looks like. You can see there are some situations like we didn't hit all the outliers, but I want to preserve as much data as possible. So I don't want to lower the Z score, but you could always lower the Z score anywhere between two to three, because at that point you're preserving most of the data anyways. But I'm happy with this. I want to create a generalized model. I don't want to over fit. I added a couple of options. Like I want to make this interactive. I want to make it fun for you guys. If you want to further clean up this data, you want to further hyper tune. Like here are a couple of things you can do. I actually deleted the liquor, beer and wine category because there were like just too many zeros in the beginning. So I actually dropped it. If you go all the way to the beginning of this notebook, I dropped in the beginning of the notebook. If you want, read that in and you can clean that up yourself and create your own time series model for that. You could maybe impute or drop or the these two different categories, or you could like go through this entire pipeline adjusting for the Z score outlier parameter. I just want to give you guys options on how you could potentially add to this notebook because it's not about copying code. It's about learning and trying things out yourself, either with new data or playing with this data in a more creative way than I'm showing you. Over here, I'm just showing you these categories plotted. I just broke it by low volume, mid volume, and high volume. So you can visualize, you know, them on similar axes, but this is what our data looks like. You know, it just looks so good in terms of time series. Like it's just awesome looking at sales data. I have a lot of fun doing it. Now we're going to go through the hyper tuning. This is the fun part. So if you look at the profit documentation over here, the doc documentation is absolutely phenomenal. So good. In the documentation, they give you the different parameters you should tune and they give you the ranges for which you can tune it with. So I just do an NP lin space over here and I just want to get a scale of like, you know, five things that I could like test out through the hyper tuning loop. These are the things you can test. In this case, I didn't want this to run for like hours and hours and days. So I only test these two things. Test change point prior scale and seasonality prior scale based on my previous work. Previously, I've also tuned change point range to generally be the length of the data frame divided by 365 if you have at least one year's worth of data. But like that doesn't matter right now. Like I just want to show you how to hyper tune and give you the code to do so you could test things out yourself. You know, you could run this entire pipeline for all the parameters you want. I'm only running it for two parameters. It takes about 18 minutes to run. It runs for all variations of change point prior scale and seasonality prior scale together between these ranges, like five numbers equidistant in the range. And then this is what the hyper tuning cross validation looks at. I create like the parameters list and then I'm using MAPES. I pick the two things for change point prior scale and seasonality prior scale are, that are going to give me the lowest MAP. The MAP is a mean absolute percentage error. I'm optimizing for the lowest mate possible because 100 minus the mate is basically your accuracy score. I want the highest accuracy score possible. So I go through this for every single situation. And I want to point out like there's a lot of like nuance in this code because I actually create a dictionary 
dictionary of dictionaries over here. I have a parameter dictionary for every single feature that is the best parameters for that feature. And then you can call that dictionary with the name of that feature. So it's like a dictionary of dictionaries. In this case, using a dictionary is much better than using a list. So it's really important for you to understand data type, data structures, and know when to do what. Just want to point that out because people always complain about algorithms, but like you need to know these things on a daily basis. Here's my dictionary of dictionaries. So if you call beverages, you get a dictionary of all of the, you know, ideal parameters and what the mean absolute percentage error is. I know this looks high right now, but like this mean absolute percentage error is through cross validation. This shouldn't be your final mean absolute percentage error. We're going to calculate that using the recent 30 days of data. This goes through a complete rolling metric situation with like one year's worth of data at a month, predict the next month out, then include that in the training set and go forward. I talk about what cross validation is in the past video. So definitely check it out if you haven't already. We have two years worth of data and my cross validation starts with an initial of 365. And then I add a period of 30 days every single time. So it cross validates, we have two years worth of data, it cross validates like 11 times, predicts the next 30 days out, gets a MAPE and so on until it's out of data. Really inherently adjusting for like all of the possible issues with like maybe the data is weird in June and it's less accurate, but it's great in August. Like this gives us the best possible parameters that are generalized for every month of the year. So we have all of our hypertune parameters. It only took 18 minutes. It's going to take a lot more time if you, you know include all of this, but you could just leave it running overnight. Make sure your laptop doesn't fall asleep. I add in holiday data. What's cool is you're going to be able to see the impact soon of the holiday data. It's super cool. Profit shows you what the trend for your data is, the impact of holidays, the impact of the seasonality you put into the model. Like this is an Ecuador data set. So I read in all of the Ecuador holidays. You could see more documentation over here where there are codes for, you know, all of the holidays. It's, it's fantastic. Such a great package to read in. Now that we read in holidays, we did all of the hyper tuning and cross validation for the best parameters. We are now going to get the error bars for our final forecast. We're going to back test 30 days. So over here, I'm back testing 30 days for every single model. I'll just go through it like line by line really quickly. We're creating forecasted data frame list. And for every single feature, we're formatting it in a way where it could be read into the profit time series model. Here, we're calling the parameter dictionary that we just went through using the feature name in the loop. For each dictionary, for each feature, we're getting the change point prior scale seasonality prior scale that had the lowest possible main. We know it's multiplicative seasonality. Again, chatted about this in the first video. I'm going to go into a lot, a lot, a lot of depth about time series models in our next and last forecasting video. So please stay tuned. I want you to know what you're hyper tuning and what it truly means and understand the math behind time series. So that's coming up next. But seasonality is multiplicative. You could always do something like this, you know, for change point range. And then we're reading in the Ecuador holiday data. We're fitting the data frame, making the predictions. And yeah, that's, that's really it. And you can see how low the mean absolute percentage errors are for beverages. We're within 3.9%. That's like a 96% accuracy. 8% for bread and bakery. Cleaning is 11%. Dairy, 3%. Deli, 2%. And so on. Like, I know I'm just spewing numbers out. I want you to look at all of this, but like, I just want to point out generally it looked decent. Frozen foods look pretty bad. Maybe like it's just not forecastable. Some things can't be forecasted. Like you have to do further research and go into depth. But like for a very generalized model, for most of these categories, we're getting good indications that it's possible to forecast. Now we're going to just go through the final forecasting. I just plotted it for the first five because I want to go through all the visuals and stuff. We went through from data cleaning to data processing to finding the best possible hypertune parameters for our situation, going through cross validation, making sure we're not like adding any biases or seasonality issues because we're only testing for a month, getting the perfect tune parameters, and then getting our most recent MAPE so we can have a back tested error that is really accurate, very specific to our data, our modeling practices. Now that we have the MAPE, that's going to generally be your error. Or also you can always use the error that's just coming straight out of profit because they give you a lower and upper bound error. But like, let's look at what this forecast looks like for the first five columns. Oh, let's also like plot. I didn't add the titles for this. Let's just add the title. Now let's just like look at it. So the first one is beverages and like this is what comes straight out of profit. We can also plot just everything above the forecast date. 
So let's just do the plot down here. That's generally like actually what we're plotting. These are all the actual data points. That's the plot, you know? I know it's not as pretty, but like that's the plot. But yeah, let's now forecast, like plot everything out and also plot it by components. These are just fantastic. Like it's so easy for you to see what's going on. But let's like take a look at the first plot. This is beverages. These are all the true data points. And then this is the forecasted plot. You can see how the trend is changing. Like this is the actual trend. Trend. This is the effect holidays have on that trend. This is the weekly and yearly seasonality on this trend. Like everything is broken out and plotted for you. It makes time series so easy to understand. This is a fantastic model. And it just does that for every single column you're going to go through in your data frame. Like it's just cool to see like the, how the trend is changing over time. There are small dips one year in just like linear trend after 2016. Like so yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope this pipeline helps you. All of this is going to be posted. And really what I want you to get out of this video is learn how to think like a data scientist, set up processes and best practices for yourself so you can be as creative as possible and also have all this code set up in the back end where you're not overwhelmed. You're just excited to learn more and like showcase more of your work. Stay tuned. The next video is going to be all about profit. Going to be pretty short. Going to go straight into what all the parameters are and how you can tune it yourself and just understand a bit about the math. So this is pretty much it for the entire video. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you guys next time.